Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Anne O'Donnell. Hello and a very warm welcome to Euromax Highlights. Here's a look at the best bits of the week for you. Coming up. Flowering facades, a garden artist turns city walls green. Veggies in the limelight, a gourmet chef tempts palates with his vegetable cuisine. And concrete wonder light flooded living rooms in windowless homes. Well, the World Expo 2015 is now into its third week in Milan. 20 million tourists are expected to visit over the next five months. So the pavilions need to be stable enough to accommodate that many people and to make an impact. Now, it's not an easy task for the architects involved either. They needed to come up with structures that weren't only practical, but also energy saving, environmentally friendly and able to withstand the test of time. So we had a look around to see which ones fitted the bill. Expos have always been places for architects to experiment. And here in Milan, they could really go wild, within limits. Organizers required that pavilions be constructed in an environmentally friendly way. That's why wood is the main construction material in evidence at Expo 2015. Take the Spanish pavilion, one of 54 national pavilions. For six months, it will present Spain to the world. So the architect faced a big challenge. How could he build a structure that's sustainable yet representative? Trying to do something that has never been seen before is the typical approach to, to a pavilion, because pavilions are supposed to surprise you. And we were trying to surprise people through the simplicity of, of, of our pavilion somehow. Other nations try to do this by using big names. Star architect Norman Foster designed this pavilion for the United Arab Emirates. The Russian pavilion opts for the expansive look. The country started off on a level playing field on the expo grounds. Each lot is only 20 meters wide along the central road, regardless of the size of the pavilion. That also posed a logistical challenge. Creating access to the property was difficult because everyone has to come from the street. The plot is very small. You can't store anything there temporarily since you'll just end up getting in the way of your neighbor. That's why construction was so time-consuming and why some things weren't finished until the last minute. The German pavilion emphasizes technical innovation rather than visual extravagance. Printed solar cells and a natural ventilation concept promote the idea of sustainability. The Italian pavilion also features surprising little details. The building's facade, which resembles tree branches, is made of a new kind of cement that can help clean the air. Architect Michele Mole helped create the concept, which is also intended to symbolize Italian culture. Uh, we choose to represent Italy with the idea of the plaza. So this great void inside the building is the place in which all the community, all the Italian community can uh, meet together and feel themselves not like uh, uh, individual people, but a like community. The Palazzo Italia will be a reminder of this expo for years to come, mainly because all the other pavilions will be torn down. That's why most of the architects used lightweight construction materials. 80% of the materials must be recyclable. But that doesn't mean architects can't come up with extravagant designs. As the French pavilion proves, the wooden building resembles a French landscape that's been turned upside down. It was based on the idea of the traditional French indoor market. Once the expo closes at the end of October, the structure by architect Anouk Legendre will be rebuilt in France. Expos have always been places to demonstrate possibilities. We used this building to demonstrate wood's diversity as a building material. Normally, wood is square-shaped, and it's been used in the same way for ages. We wanted to show that wood can be used in new ways and that the shapes can be very free. Many people don't realize you can do something like this with wood, have this freedom. But then, France is the land of liberty. The British Pavilion takes a completely different approach. It's designed to resemble a beehive, complete with a swarm of bees. 
Composed of 170,000 parts, it's more like an accessible artwork than a building. Its creator doesn't only want to highlight the ecological importance of bees. The design by British architect and artist Wolfgang Buttress is also a plea for a more people-friendly architecture. For me, I think the most successful architecture is, is the one where, where it, the, the, the person is, is in the centre of the architecture, where it's, uh, you can have amazing shapes, textures, rooms, meaning. But, but to me, it's, it's, it's how it feels when you're actually inside the building. 20 million visitors are expected to come to Expo 2015. Some 1.3 billion euros have been spent creating the pavilions. Will they influence the future of architecture? Something is happening on the architecture scene. The topic of conserving resources is being taken very seriously. That has to start in the area of reduction. We can see that here on the pavilion's roof, but also all around us. Though they may be temporary, the Expo pavilions are visually stunning and leave a lasting impression. We head off now to the Austrian city of Graz, which, by the way, is the hometown of Hollywood actor Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, Graz is famous for other things as well, like its castles, squares and landmarks that reflect the prosperity of bygone eras. And last year, it was recognised for its innovative design. And the best way to get to know a city is through someone who lives there, so we did just that. Graz is among the oldest cities in Europe. Evidence has been found of settlements dating back 5,000 years. The old city center is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. But Graz also has a modern face. In 2011, it was named a city of design. Sigrid Ram has written a number of books about her home city. Graz is just the right size. Big enough so you don't run into someone you might not want to see, but small enough that whenever you go downtown, you meet someone you know. Castle Hill rises 120 meters above the main square. There's a funicular railway that carries people to the top, where they get a magnificent view of the city and the Moor River. The site served as an imposing fortress for centuries. In the 19th century, Ludwig Baron von Welden commissioned a park here. It's quite a luxury having this green hill in the middle of the city. It's very close to the hearts of the people of Graz. Almost everyone has their Schlossberg story, mostly of a romantic nature, their first kiss or their first date. The clock tower is the city's best-known landmark. Its present form dates back to the 16th century. The odd thing about this clock is that the hands are reversed. The big hand indicates the hours and the little one the minutes. That's for the simple reason that it's easier to tell the time from a distance. The Frankovich Delicatessen is a long-standing institution in Graz. Open-faced sandwiches are all it sells, a business model that's done well for over 70 years. We have more than 20 women working here, and they make everything fresh. They make sandwiches, and they keep up the quality. Graz Castle is a former residence of the Habsburg dynasty. Today, it houses the Styrian state government. A highlight for visitors is the impressive double staircase, a masterpiece of Gothic architecture. What's unique about this stairway is that it's made up of two spiral staircases running in opposite directions. On every floor they merge into one stairway and separate again. You might say it's a design from the Middle Ages. Locals call it the Stairway of Reconciliation. The Kunsthaus Modern Art Gallery was built in 2003. Detractors said the exterior looked like a cross between a jellyfish and a spaceship. As you can imagine, this project didn't appeal to everyone from the start. But once it was built and they put in the windows, people started showing up and watching the Kunsthaus grow and take shape. It gradually turned into something the people of Graz could identify with. 
The Kunsthaus hosts temporary exhibitions of modern and contemporary art. From the museum's viewing platform, the panorama of the old town almost becomes a work of art in itself. Behind the museum is the Kunsthaus Café, a trendy meeting place for young artists. An entire designer scene has developed around the Kunsthaus, and now it's hip. Graz was a European capital of culture in 2003. The floating Moor Island was originally an art project created for the occasion. The Moor Island was conceived by architect Vito Anconci as a giant seashell. It floats in the river, rising and dropping with the water level. It's a kind of sanctuary for people in Graz, both for residents and guests from out of town. The island was supposed to have been dismantled in late 2003, but the people of Graz wanted to keep it. Now it's a major attraction. Well, when you live in a big city like Berlin, Paris or Madrid, greenery and gardens are very much a welcome sight in the concrete jungles. Well, we caught up with one garden artist who gives city dwellers that visual respite that they've been looking for. Patrick Blanc designs vertical garden systems that allow plants and buildings to live in harmony with one another. Well, your Max sat down with him in Paris for a closer look at his creations. This vertical garden is located in Paris's Montaugueil district. It's the work of Patrick Blanc, also known as the Green Man, with hair to match. There are very few green spaces in the second arrondissement. That's why I thought this project was so interesting. I also like the fact that a private person wanted to commission a vertical garden, not just for themselves, but for the general public. And this leafy oasis, so unexpected in an urban setting, is really growing on people. It's lovely. I watched it flourish. Everyone comes to take a look and take photos. It makes me very happy. Every day I sit down here and admire it. It was quite by surprise that we turned the corner and there it was. And uh, it's amazing, just spectacular. It's lovely. There should be more of them. This is what the facade used to look like. The garden structure was installed in February 2013, and shortly after that, the first greenery was planted. Since then, more than 250 types of plant have flourished on the southwest facing wall. And it still has surprises in store for Patrick Blanc. I can see weeds are growing here, in the midst of a flower I imported from Taiwan. That wasn't supposed to happen, but it's a nice weed. Look at the blue flowers. That's part of a vertical garden too, it's full of surprises. You never know what might happen. This is where Patrick Blanc gets most of his ideas his own private jungle outside Paris, bursting with exotic birds, fish, and all sorts of plants. He was only 12 when he had his first idea for a vertical garden. It's a pretty complex design. A fiber layer works like a kind of wet cliff. It's only three millimeters thick and is kept damp through perforated pipes. The plant roots develop in this polyamide layer, and then a natural plant landscape emerges in the artificial substance. And because it's plastic, it lasts a long time. Patrick Blanc's first major public project involved creating a vertical garden in 2006 for the Paris Museum Musée du Quai Branly, next to the Eiffel Tower. It was quite a challenge. 
The façade of this museum completely faces north and is opposite the Seine River. That means there's a lot of wind and it wasn't easy to find plants that suit those conditions. Blanc's green walls are now in demand all around the world. He has worked with renowned architects Jacques Herzog and Pierre de Meuron on an installation for an art museum in Miami. He's also collaborating with architect Jean Nouvel to build a 200-meter high vertical garden in Kuala Lumpur. These famous architects often come to me with daring projects and then we need to discuss them because I know what the plants need and the architects don't necessarily know that. Even Patrick Blanc can't say for sure how long his designs will last, but his own wall is still going strong after almost 35 years. Well, we head back now to Austria to try out the Viennese cuisine for our next report. In Vienna, vegetarian cuisine is growing in popularity, which is hard to believe in a city that claims it invented the famed Wiener Schnitzel or the breaded meat dish. However, appetites are growing for healthier diets and that trend is being reflected in the number of restaurants which are now offering vegetarian menus. One of those is called Tian, located a stone's throw away from Vienna's famous concert halls. An island surrounded by beer sauce, mushrooms and asparagus. Vegetarian dishes as beautiful as a painting, arranged with artistry. Unusual ingredients including purple carrots. A coral reef made of parmesan. Even the desserts are almost too beautiful to eat. This ball of chocolate hides a secret lemon sorbet with a delicate sweet biscuit. Karl Ivic is the man behind these works of art. His father is Croatian, his mother Austrian. Ivic learned his trade in Switzerland, Germany and Austria. Although he sometimes eats meat, Ivic has become a fan of vegetarian cuisine. It's elegant rather than rustic, made with imagination and featuring choice ingredients such as truffles. It's decadent. Many might call it decadent, but I don't think so, because this is all a gift from nature. Sure, the price may be high, but when we talk about the culinary arts, we should have respect for what nature has to offer. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to cook with these special ingredients. Today, the truffles will go into a ratatouille. When it comes to purely vegetarian restaurants, even gourmet eateries often find that premium prices are a hard sell with customers. But the effort and expense involved in vegetarian cuisine can be even higher than traditional meat and fish-based cooking. In Tien, a lunch dish costs 32 euros. In the evening, menus with several courses run between 80 and 120 euros. In Vienna, capital of the Wiener Schnitzel, such vegetarian cuisine is a culinary novelty. Quality and passion make the difference. Convincing our guests was difficult in the beginning, of course, but meanwhile, I think vegetarian cuisine can hold its own alongside schnitzel. In Chinese, Tian means heaven or sky, and food critics agree, Paul Ivich's cooking is heavenly. He's been awarded one star by the Michelin Gourmet Restaurant Guide and three tokes by Gourmet York. Vegetarian cuisine is finally coming into its own. Vegetarian cuisine, at least in Austria, has a kind of whole grain image. It's always been seen as sort of alternative. Not really about pleasure, but about healthy eating. What's nice nowadays is that healthy eating has as much status as creativity and flavor, and it's all come together. Paul Ivich spends up to 16 hours a day in his restaurant. That makes his leisure time all the more valuable. Cooking for me is like yoga, but I also do real yoga play tennis with my brother, and soccer with friends. Tian opened in 2011 in the center of Vienna. At first, some guests just ordered a salad and a glass of water. But meanwhile, more and more customers are open to vegetarian experimentation. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not a vegetarian. I was skeptical and wondered if it would be filling, but it is. It's amazing what you can do with natural ingredients and vegetables. I didn't expect all these really interesting flavors here today. This kind of haute cuisine is hard to recreate at home. That's why Paul Ivich also compiled some simpler recipes for his cookbook. We should all pay attention to what promotes our well-being. Your food should be your medicine and vice versa. I'd say eating 80% meat or fish-free meals would do us good. Here in Vienna, Paul Ivich has already won over many carnivores to his way of eating. Let's cross over now to Portugal for a look at a dream home on a suburb outside of Lisbon. Ana Hernandez and her family built their designer abode there during the country's financial crisis. It wasn't exactly an ideal situation for them, but since then, they've made the most of this ultra-modern living space. It's minimalistic, unadorned and windowless. Hello, this is Ana Hernandez. Please come to my house. Welcome. Ana Hernandez and her family have been living in this concrete cube in Aldea de Juso, west of Lisbon, for a few years now. The big surprise is how light and transparent the interior is. It's a house that is built, all the walls are in, in glass, and in this way, the sensation is that we have a house double that where it is. We have several pieces of, of glass that you can open. So we can open this, this wall here, and we go directly to the, to the garden. The house stands on a lot just 350 square meters in size. To gain living space, it was designed with two stories above and one story underground. Privacy was given a high priority, which is why the outer walls have no windows. Ana Hernandez shows us around the nearly 170 square meters of living space hidden away inside the concrete cube. We have the secret here. Here's where you see the windows that seem not to exist. Downstairs, from downstairs, every room has, you know, this terrace. The patios are different sizes, but all of them are painted white to reflect the light into the house. The atrium-style patio is a traditional Spanish and Portuguese home design that found its way into this contemporary architecture. I guess it's a very uh, typical theme from the south, from the architecture in the south. You know, all these patios that gives you light but preserves you also a little bit from hot. Yeah. So these patios is like a, a way to, 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 to have an extra space and get fresh in the, in the summer or get a little bit warm from the sun in the, in the winter. This minimalistic home is surrounded by the neighborhood's bungalow-style houses. The Hernandez family originally had it built with the intention of selling it. But then Portugal's debt crisis hit in 2010. We start building it in the worst possible moment ever, you know. So to finish it was not problematic because we have all the, the, the things already planned and everything, but of course was almost impossible to sell it at that point, you know. So the family moved in. And ever since, they've had to keep explaining to people on the street that it's a residence, not a school or an indoor swimming pool. It was made uh, by an architect with our inputs of what we want, so it's really good. It's the house is really nice, you know. How couldn't I didn't like to, to live here? Ironically, the crisis provided Ana Hernandez and her family with just the house they wanted. One that has lots of room and lots of light. At this point, they can hardly imagine living anywhere else. 
That's it for now. Thanks for watching. If you've missed anything, of course, you can always catch up with us online. And until next week, we'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.